interesting stuff on venom metering and scorpions and things for look venom it's not just for snakes there's also some spiders some octopods some scorpions thanks for bringing scorpions into the boat i'm gonna let you get going all right thanks Luke. all right i'm i'm an undergraduate student at southern adventist university i realized i forgot to put it in um, the slides there but i am working with dr corbett and nelson over there in the corner and I have been working on venom metering in Vegas, Carolina, in response to chemosensory stimuli and physical stress. So, I'm gonna real quickly talk about species. Is Vegas, Carolina, is a is a small species of scorpion that is native to the southeastern United States, mainly Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama, Kentucky, and Carolinas. And unlike what most people would think of with desert scorpions. It prefers more moist climates and kind of cooler, more temperate environments. And they are nocturnal and glow in their black head. So all of the scorpions that I found had in my study were found on the campus of the school we had at Trails out back that I would just go out on at night with a black light and they glow in their black light and I caught them. So you can see that there on the picture. So I know you all are probably more experts in venom metering than I am, but I'm gonna talk about it a little bit myself. So, venom metering is the strategic behavioral control of a, the release of venom by an organism. And the idea is that it is to reduce the metabolic cost that creating the venom has on the organism <laughs> by strategically controlling how it is released. Do, by assessing threats, and prey to decide how much venom the creature wants to release the organism. And venom metering can be seen in first in the uh, in the decision to actually release venom, as there are dry bites in some snakes and dry stings and scorpions as well. And then second is how they control the amount of venom that is released. So there are specifically for scorpions, there are kind of two <coughs> ideas of what, how they might do this. And one is that they actually control, they have muscles that control the venom gland and the amount of venom that is released, or it could be like set with the stings, and then they sting more to release more. So the, the purpose of this study was to see and document the possible venom metering of the Jovis in response to chemical and um, tactile stimuli. So the methods where we would place each scorpion in an eight ounce brown plastic container with parafilm that was on the bottom of it. <laughs> now, then each scorpion would have a minute to acclimate, and after that acclimation, they would have one of four tests done on them. Each test had two variables. These variables were high threat, which was two tasks per second to the chelate, the claws of the scorpion, and low threat, which was one tap per second to the claws. The other variable was the presence or absence of urine, which was originally going to be rodent urine, but previous preliminary work by another student showed that they avoided human urine, and frankly, it's much cheaper to just go with that. <laughs> <laughs> so the tests were chosen in a randomized order, and each scorpion underwent each test with a week break in between. And kind of our hypothesis going into this was that the presence of urine and a higher threat would increase the amount of venom that was released by the scorpions. So in high threat and presence of urine, it would supposedly release more than low threat and no urine. Now the methods for venom collection was we'd have a small probe, which is a fancy word for a zip tie with parabenol on and we put the tail of the scorpion with either two taps or one tap, and elicit a response when the scorpion would sting the parafilm, the venom would beat up on it, and we would take a small one microliter microcapillary tube and collect the venom in there. And then I put it under a microscope and would measure the length and put it into the spreadsheet with the formula for the volume of the cylinder. Now all these trials were recorded on iPhone 14 future analysis. Actually, here's one of those now. This one is a, a because it shows a lot of the kind of some of the struggles that I had in this 
mainly being that the scorpion was really fast. They were all very fast. You wouldn't, you wouldn't expect it, but they were. And then the other problem, which I believe it shows in the end, is that they did stuff a lot, which a lot of the time for the females wasn't an issue, but yeah, there it is. But for males, when they're about half the size of females, sometimes they did stuff and then lift themselves up with their tail and just start spinning in air. And it was, it was kind of concerning, because I couldn't stop it, but it was slightly amusing as well. So, as for now, all the trials have been completed, and the sample size of the videos came up to about 166, because we lost like two scorpions in the middle. So we did not detect any significant relationship between venom volume and the ur and urine or threat level. <coughs> However, we did detect that females release significantly more ven venom than males, most likely due to size. Again, they were about twice the size of average males. So here's the graph for that one. You can see we have a couple of outliers in the female one. There was one that almost overflo overflowed the capillary tube. That was a little bit scary. <laughs> So, as you can see, it's less than 0 0.1, 0 0.01. It is most likely due to size, however. Other than that, between the variables, we have a very kind of flat box plot there. It really didn't show much. So, the effects were not super visible in any significant way besides mass, as you can see with small p-value. Now, so, and uh, what's next in our experiment? I, the videos still have to be analyzed for the behavioral data to be collected, which the data that I will be collecting is the sting frequency, pinch frequency, latency to sting, latency to flee, and the number of taps that I elicit upon the scorpion to see if that has any kind of change on the amount of venom that they release. Also, this, this whole next section is a little bit of a side note, but I just thought it was neat. We, oh, 28 of our 30 females gave birth to scorplings, which as far as I can tell is the, the actual term for it, which is adorable. Um, so 93% of them kind of confirms that scorpions give birth every year. It's an annual thing, it's not biannual. And we had at least at least 200 scorplings, which they'd be on their mother's back until their first instar, or second instar, sorry, which is their first molt, which I actually, yeah, I have a picture of them molting there. Just thought that was kind of neat. A little bit of a side note, but, so, <laughs> our conclusions is, well, our preliminary tests suggested that they avoided human urine, the species does not react in, um, in the release of venom due to the presence of urine, even if it might make them slightly more uncomfortable, it did not show up in the amount of venom that they released. And this species may also modulate its venom used by controlling if and when it sings rather than directly controlling the venom volume, which is what we're trying to see in the review of the videos where I'm going to count the number of stings. And then there are also maybe problems with our with our methodology, like tactile stimulus might be too intense, so maybe I just tapped them too hard and they just instantly went into terror mode and injected all the venom they could, which would explain the probably the difference between males and females. But yeah, that's kind of where I'm at, and all of this, there's some acknowledgments, I'm more excited. Any questions? Excellent, excellent, excellent. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Well, I say, we, these um, scientists and investigators seem younger and younger all the time. He's a scorpling himself. <laughs> 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 really cool work you're doing. And you get to like, do experiments with like scorpions and stuff. I want your job, man. It's so cool.